Okay, um, I guess we'll we'll get started. Um, welcome to our first 2023 20, webinar on teaching abroad. Um, my name is Diane Jacoteau and I'm the managing director and founder of Edvectus. So um, this webinar is really for, for people who are thinking about teaching abroad, embarking on their first trip abroad, um, or just want to learn to learn more. Um, so I will get started. Okay. So in terms of what we'll talk about, um, I'll just a brief bit about us, who we are, what we do, um, and then we'll launch into the real meat of this uh, presentation, which is an understanding of international schools, what they are and what they're not. Um, some information about salary and benefits, because I think it's really important to understand how international schools pay you and what kind of benefits they offer and what they don't. Because when you're balancing and looking at different opportunities, you need to really understand what you're looking at. We'll talk about types of opportunities uh, that have to do with what, where you are in your career and, and your experience level and what kind of opportunities you can have. We'll talk about general requirements, uh, timelines, when schools tend to hire, when they don't, and then the real important part, which is questions. Now, uh, this is a fairly new tool for us, um, and I'm here with my trusty recruitment partner, Paul, who is manning the questions and answers and the polls. So if you've got questions as we go, feel free to put them in the question chat, which I hope you have access to. Um, maybe if you could do a little test for Paul, let him know that the questions are there. Uh, because this is, like I said, it's a new tool. So we're, we're playing with it as we, as we go. But if, please put your questions in there. Paul will answer what he can and what he can't, I will pick up at the end. Okay, so let's go. Just a brief about us. Uh, Advectus is a company. We're now 10 years old, uh, and we've got about 12 people working for us. Uh, most of the people that work at Advectus are ex-teachers with international experience. Everyone working at Advectus has lived and worked abroad. So I feel it's important um, because we know what it takes and we know what some of the challenges are. And I think that makes us uh, makes us, frankly, better at our jobs. What we do is we match qualified teachers to international school jobs. Uh, many people get confused. They think we're a job board where schools post jobs and you apply and then it just goes. And that is not what we are. Uh, we actually match people to jobs where we feel they can be hired for those jobs. And you'll understand a lot more when I get into this presentation about what schools are looking for and how they're so different. Um, so we actually match you, we guide you, we uh, help you get interviews, we help you prepare for interviews, we tell you what schools are looking for. So it's it's really a lot more than a job board. Um, because we are a company of ex-teachers, we do provide le learning resources. Uh, the, the fundamental problem why I started Advectus to begin with is that people don't know what they don't know the first time they go abroad. You don't even know what questions to ask. And, and so we are actually trying to teach teachers about teaching abroad. And so you'll find that there's learning resources online. When we match you to jobs, we send you many more learning resources. It, it is really all about educating teachers. Um, about what they need to know. As a team, we have over, over 60 years of experience. I personally have over 20 um, in terms of international teacher recruitment and school leader recruitment. So this is really what we do and that's all we do. Uh, just a quick note about terminology. Uh, you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm American. Um, our company is headquartered in the UK. Uh, we have to pick a certain kind of terminology, regardless of the school that we work with. We work with American schools, British schools, bilingual schools, Australian schools, all kinds, but we tend to use British terminology just to be consistent. So what that means is elementary in the US is primary in the UK. So we'll, I'll be using the terms primary teaching to talk about elementary. Secondary comprises middle and high school, so 11 to 18. And those are the terminologies that I'll tend to use. OK, so let's talk about what international schools are. There is no 
formal definition. There's no international definition of what an international school is. But the broadly accepted definition is they use a curriculum and or a language of instruction that's different to the host country. So that means that you could be the American school in Bahrain, or you can be the French school of New York. You can be the bilingual school that uses English as a language of instruction in Spain, but using a Spanish curriculum. So it means that it's something different than what the normal state schools in that country would give you. They do teach compulsory education. So I'm not talking about teaching English as a foreign language, although, Many of you teaching abroad will be teaching English language learners. I'm talking about teaching all subjects, compulsory education. So rather than putting their children in a state school in this country, they are putting their children in an international school to teach all subjects. So that's really important, um, an important differentiation. You might be teaching English language learners, but you are teaching compulsory education. Um, international schools are attended by expatriate children, but they're also attended by host nationals who want an international education. And we'll talk about the history of it, but, um, but I think this is a really important because when people go abroad, oftentimes for the first time, they think either they're going to be teaching blonde hair, blue eyed British kids in a British school that happens to be in Bahrain, or they think that they're going to be teaching English to English language learners after school in China. And that's not the case. Um, it is everything in between. Another important differentiation is many, many international schools are for profit, but not always. Um, but you just have to wrap your head around this, that because they are private schools, they're fee paying schools, um, they can be for profit. And that does not necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It is a different thing. OK, international schools are growing in the past 10 years. So from 2013 to 2023, the number of international schools has grown over 50 percent. Compare this to state schools in most Western countries, which have remained relatively flat because our birth rates are dropping. Um, you will see that, the, that it is quite vibrant in terms of the opportunities. Um, and not only are the number of schools growing, but they're getting bigger. So the number of teachers needed is even bigger than 50%. Um, and this is based on data from ISD research. And this is just international schools. So this doesn't count state schools that hire foreign teachers, which is another whole kettle of fish. So the number of international opportunities is huge. So let's talk about the types of international schools. Now, these are my terminologies. Um, there is no accepted terminology, but I'll try to explain them the best that I can. The first one was the original kind of international school. This was a monocultural British school for British kids just happened to be in Kenya or an American school for American kids that just happened to be in Singapore. So these are the schools that the original small number, there was less than a thousand of them 20 years ago. Um, and these are the schools if you were in an embassy, if you're an embassy worker or if you were in a multinational, one of the few people working in a multinational, this is where you put your kids. But this is the very smallest number right now. Broadly international school, uh, schools tend to they have to use a particular curriculum. So they might use a British, an American, a Canadian, or an Australian, or an IB curriculum. But they have children from many different nationalities. Now, you'll see these in countries where there's a lot of expatriate professional workers. So for instance, Dubai, uh, the UAE, you'll see a lot of broadly international schools. You'll see them in places like Singapore. You'll see them in China. You'll see them in Thailand. So places where expatriates uh, who are professional class tend to congregate, you're going to see broadly international schools. The next one is a local international school. So they will use a particular curriculum. They could use an American curriculum, a British curriculum, an IB, or a local curriculum, but they tend to be monocultural. So that means that the children are of the host country and the, the culture of the school the leadership tends to be of the host country, even if they use an international curriculum. So this is these are more moderate fee paying. The salaries are going to be a little bit lower because they're more accessible to host nationals. The final kind are bilingual or state schools, and they may use the host country curriculum. An example of this is Emirates School Establishment, 
which uh, are state schools across the UAE and they hire international teachers. They can also hire advisory teachers or regular classroom teachers. Th these kinds of um, opportunities aren't necessarily international schools, but they're international teaching opportunities. So if we look at the number of international school jobs, this is the original expatriate. So this is that little British bubble happens to be in a foreign country or a little American bubble in a, in a foreign country. This is the original kind of, there's very few of them, uh, fewer than one in 15, one in 20 international schools are this kind. This is, uh, relatively speaking, the number of broadly international schools. So you can see that there's more opportunities because there's more expatriates of all different kinds now working uh, internationally. But the number of local international and state school jobs is by far the biggest. And this is just because of globalization, because local host nationals realize that they want their children to have an international education and they're willing to pay for it. Or state schools want their schools to be internationalized and hire foreign teachers. So if you look at the number, just the sheer number of opportunities, it is largely in the right hand side. Now, regionally, there are international schools in every country that I know of, with the exception of Antarctica and North Korea. Um, but there are more opportunities in some places than others. And I've put a little happy face where those the majority of international schools lie. So the Middle East and the Far East have the most number of international schools and the most the, the highest number of international opportunities with Southeast Asia following close behind. So this is where if you look for international jobs, you're just more likely to find them. But that doesn't mean that there's not jobs elsewhere. It just means it's a, just a sheer numbers game. So I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what international schools look like. And so I just went back in my photo library because I, when I go to schools, I take pictures of them. And these are some recent pictures that I've taken. Uh, and I just need to ha hasten to add that I am not a professional photographer, which you will soon find out. Okay, this is a, a local international school in Saudi Arabia. So this is a school using an American curriculum, uh, mostly for Saudi kids and they hire expatriate teachers, uh, like this one that we placed in the school from South Africa. So you'll notice that the kids are local looking, the classrooms might be a little smaller. This is a more moderate fee paying school, uh, a lovely school nonetheless. This is a um, more of a broadly international school in Bangkok, Thailand. So you can see it's gonna be a little bit bigger. Um, you can see the greenery, it's just reflective of the local um, local environment. Uh, this is an Australian school in Thailand. This uh, is actually a classroom and, and this is a school that is a very progressive school. This is where the children learn. There's a whiteboard that travels around the room. We think sometimes they look like uh, we work or um, you know, they're really different, these progressive schools. So what I'm trying to get across here is there's all different kinds. This is another progressive school in a different country. This one is in Saudi Arabia. It's, an, it's actually a bilingual school that uses a very progressive approach. So you can kind of get an idea that the schools and the, and the classrooms are all different. This is the outside of one in Al Ain, uh, it's a British school. This is one small part of a giant school in Beijing. This is just the arts center. There are dozens of buildings in this K-12 school in Beijing for 3,000 children. This is the inside of a very top tier school in Malaysia, um, one of those original expatriate schools that I mentioned. And yes, they have a climbing wall inside. Uh, and this is an idea of the library. So um, this final one is uh, one of the teachers that we placed in state schools in the UAE. Uh, just to make sure that we're waving the flag for them as well. Okay, let's talk about pay, uh, because I know pay and benefits are important. Um, Two-year contracts are, are normal. Uh, and I know that kind of sits funnily with teachers coming from countries where you have an indefinite contract, but this generally aligns with the visa so that, that you can renew at the end of two years, but they typically want you to be there for two years. 
to align with the visa, but also because the first year is basically you just finding your way to the toilet and figuring out how the school works. And you really don't make a huge impact until that second year. You don't find your feet until the second year. And that's why a lot of schools just want, because they put a lot of money up front, getting you there, paying for the visa, paying for the flight, paying for everything, you settling in, they kind of recoup their expense in the second year. So that, that's why it's typical. But you can find one year and you can find three year contracts and you can find indefinite. Um, the visa is pro usually provided by the school with the exception of Europe, uh, where if you're an EU citizen, you have a right to work. Um, flights and housing or housing allowance are usually provided by the school, uh, but not always. Um, it is less common in Europe to get flights and housing. You can sometimes see it, but you often don't. Now, flights may be annual. So you go there in the beginning of the year, you fly back home, then you come back in the beginning of the next year and you fly back home, or they could be at the beginning and end of a contract. And so you just need to look at each opportunity and, and understand what they're offering you. Some flights might be reimbursed. It's a minority, but sometimes they're reimbursed upon arrival. Sometimes they just give you a flight ticket. Um, and I would note that some contracts now, including housing allowance in the salary, so the salary is going to look quite inflated, um, but you need to do the maths. And when you're comparing different opportunities, how much is housing going to cost you? Because if housing is super expensive, you could be working in a false economy. Um, so just watch that. And we always note it when we send you job descriptions and we try to note it um, and make it very clear, but that's something to ask. Housing could be provided by the school or the housing allowances is often, uh, especially in the Middle East and Far East and Southeast Asia. But you need to know that housing may not be sufficient for the family or spouse. It may be shared housing, which is not going to work if you've got a spouse or children. Um, and housing allowances may not cover the full cost. So this is something that you really need to research when you apply. Look at the housing allowance, do some research and figure out what it covers or what it doesn't. Uh, another key point is that local, international, and bilingual schools or state schools abroad may not be suitable for your dependents. If you can imagine, um, let's say, a, a school in the Middle East that mainly educates Emiratis, and those kids are mainly speaking Arabic, although they're learning in English, and you plunk your little 14-year-old child in that school, at this very delicate age, how well are they actually going to assimilate? How is their social life going to be? How are they going to learn? So um, you really need to look out for this, the kind of school depending on your family. That being said, not all schools are family friendly. Um, flights, medical, or even free tuition might not be paid. And so you need to do your math. You need to figure out how much is this going to cost you because it could very well be unaffordable. Um, medical, for instance, in in, the, in China is quite expensive. And if it's not provided by the school for your dependents, then you need to factor that into your equation, regardless of how high the salary is. And that equation happens in every part of the world. So just do your maths. Um, bonuses are common in the Middle East. In fact, they are required by law. Uh, they're called gratuity in the Middle East. You might see that term. That means uh, the money that is paid at the end of a successful contract. Um, so that is by law. Asia, uh, it's usually not required by law, but they like to throw them into contracts and they're often dependent upon you achieving certain milestones. So take a look for those. They can actually count uh, for quite a lot of money. Let's talk more about money. So you have a job in the UK paying £30,000 a year. And I say, hey, I've got this job in the UAE. And, and it pays 20,000 pounds a year. Or, hey, I've got this job in China and it pays 18,000 uh, pounds a year. And you say, why would I do that? Uh, and let me tell you why. So I'm just taking the yearly salary and I'm dividing it by 12, right? So here is your yearly salary in the UK and here is your yearly salary abroad. And it doesn't look very good for the abroad team. But in the UK, you're going to pay income tax, national insurance. You're going to pay rent or mortgage. You're going to pay council tax. You're going to pay utilities. And that leaves you with a certain amount a month. And, and in my little calculation, which is based on 
calculators that I could find, uh, you get 1,200 uh, pounds a month. Okay, now let's take a look at the abroad team. Well, there's no tax in the Middle East or tax is often covered by a school. Uh, you're not paying rent because you get a house, uh, house or housing allowance. You're not paying council tax and they often cover utilities. So you're actually pocketing more money than you would uh, abroad. But in addition, we have to look at the cost of living. And the cost of living in many foreign countries where you go is a lot lower than your home country. And there, there's some, these are calculations that you have to do depending on where you are and where you're going. But as an example, in Cairo, that 1,500 pounds a month is worth 2,400 in buying power in Cairo, or 1,900 in the UAE or 1700 in Beijing. So, so that money is actually going further because things cost less. So this is the kind of calculation that you need to do and that you need to understand. And that's where that whole package comes in and why you need to understand the package. Okay, types of opportunities. And this is gonna depend on your experience, your years of full-time experience, ideally in the curriculum of the school to which you are applying. So if you've not got two years of experience, um, you're really looking at more local international schools. You're looking at a limited number of countries because not all countries allow you to work there with less than two years experience. And you might be looking at last minute or unpredictable vacancies because frankly, these schools would prefer someone with more experience and they're not willing to compromise if they can until later. Your salary is going to be at the lower end of the scale. Uh, it's most likely not going to be a family-friendly job, and the management of the school is going to be more reflective of that host national country. So you're going to have less westernized uh, in, many, in many instances, but not all. You can have less westernized manage, management. So this is kind of what you've got. Now, if you've got a family, I would wholly recommend that you wait until you've got two or more years of experience, because then opportunities open up. Uh, two to five years experience, we're looking at accessing broadly international schools, we're looking at local international schools at the higher end of the scale. Um, some of them can be family friendly and the management will tend to be expatriate regardless of the kind of school that it is. If you've got five or more years experience in the curriculum of the school, and I'm talking about solid years of experience rather than maybe supply teaching, but real solid good experience in that curriculum, you can kind of, you can apply to any kind of school. Um, you can also access some middle leader jobs and you can uh, look at accessing advisory leadership. So that's when the doors tend to open when you've got five years of that curriculum experience. And what I'm saying is if you're applying to an IB school, you have IB curriculum experience to get these kinds of posts. If you're applying to an American school, an Australian school, a British school, you've got that kind of experience. Some considerations. Um, that little calculation that I did can fall apart if you have to send a lot of money home. So that 12, you know, 1,200 pounds in Cairo, if you're gonna have to send 1,000 pounds of it home, then you're left with 200 and you need to figure out if that's gonna make ends meet for you. So sending money home is a consideration. Regard, it, it takes into account, it, it, if the cost of living is low, that doesn't matter if you're sending most of it home. Um, Family, partner, and pets. Uh, I've talked about family. Unmarried partners, um, in most countries, you cannot sponsor them. So your unmarried partner, if they wish to go abroad, has to go under their own steam. They have to get their own visa. That means they have to be employable and somebody has to want to employ them. And that's something you really need to take into account. Uh, if you're married, then there are most of the time you can sponsor your spouse. Uh, not in all countries, but many countries. Uh, but if you're unmarried, then there's no legal tie between you. Pets and international teaching are broadly incompatible. Uh, it costs a lot of money to bring pets into a foreign country. Many countries culturally are incompatible. Dogs, for instance, in the Middle East, culturally incompatible. Um, the, if the school is providing housing for you, that housing might not allow pets. And so I can tell you that we've had more international jobs fall apart for pets than almost anything else. So if you don't have a pet, I'd, can, I'd say don't get one. Uh, and if you do have a pet, I would say think about leaving him at home with a trusted family member or friend for at least the first year. Okay, health and pre-existing conditions. Um, 
Firstly, there are visa requirements. Many countries have a visa related health check. And if you have uh, the big three, tuberculosis, HIV, or hepatitis C, you will likely not get residency in a majority of foreign countries. And so if you have any of those conditions, then you really need to do some research as to where you can go. Um, if you've got pre-existing conditions, diabetes, uh, you take regular medication, you need to do some research before you apply as to whether you can get that medication on the health insurance policy and also in the country, full stop. Uh, finally, personality. If you're going to work abroad, you really need to be quite adventurous and resilient and you need to be able to take a hit and keep on ticking. And um, We've noticed that with COVID, there's, you know, a lot of people have dealt with a lot with COVID and the resiliency might be low. Uh, and, and I would say if your personal resiliency is quite low, it's not the right thing to go abroad because you're going to be tested. You're going to have to learn a new way of living, a new way of teaching, a new way of being, and it will test you. Now, once once you get comfortable in that country, it's amazing and it's life changing but it ain't easy in the first six months. So uh, you need to think about that at, as far as timing. Typical requirements uh, for an international school. Typically, they require uh, some kind of teacher training, such as a PGCE, BED, Master's of Education for primary or secondary. Uh, almost every country that we work with requires a bachelor's degree. Um, your ECT, your early career teaching, your um, probationary years can rarely be done abroad. There are some examples of it, but they are quite competitive. So I would say if you are an ECT teacher, you, you probably are best to do that at home uh, before you go abroad. And degree matching is becoming the bane of our existence and very common. Uh, especially in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, places like Vietnam. And what this means is that you have to have a degree, a bachelor's degree at, or a master's degree in the subject that you teach. So if you're a math teacher, they want a math degree. If you're an English teacher, they want an English degree. And these foreign ministries of education don't really understand that an engineering degree is applied science or maths. And they say, you can only teach engineering or you, if you're a law degree, you can only teach law. So this is something to watch out for. And we try to keep on top of this so that when we match you to jobs, we match you to countries that we think can hire you. But this is a real, um, real bugbear for many teachers. And, and trust me, it's not my idea. It's the Ministry of Education. Um, there are maximum age limits in many countries. Uh, for instance, Brunei is 52 or 54. Um, Qatar is 52. Uh, the Middle East, uh, UAE is right around about 60 for most teachers. Um, so there are age limits in many countries, uh, maximum age limits. There are also minimum experience limits. So there are many countries where you have to have two or more years of experience for them to hire you. This is an, a, a bit of protectionism in their country. They don't, if they're bringing a foreign worker in, they want to make sure that there's not a local worker who can do that job. So bringing in a newly qualified teacher is you know, kind of a slap in the face to an experienced local teacher. So they, they do set some minimum re experience requirements. So in China, for instance, it's two years. Um, th there are these limits all over the place, part of why we match you. Um, they do want to see recent whole school teaching experience, teaching what you are trained to teach. So an example of that is if you are primary trained, but you're teaching secondary math, uh, they're not going to like that because the ministries, many ministries just say it doesn't come for you. They, they don't get why you're teaching something out of your subject area. Some countries are okay, but many of them are not. You need to have good teaching references. Uh, and this is not to say testimonials from your recent employers, but uh, most good schools will want confidential references from your immediate supervisor, head teacher, principal, head of department. Um, and this is why you need to keep them on side. Uh, so you need good teaching references. The better the school, the more this is important. You need an appropriate federal criminal record check. And if you have a criminal history, it can get in your way in certain countries. So do talk to us about that. We can help guide you and let you know what can and cannot be a problem and where 
you might choose to apply um, if you have a criminal history. Um, you do need to be culturally sensitive and culturally aware, and schools are going to test you on this during interview. So they want to know that you realize that you are teaching outside your home country and culture and curriculum, and that you're flexible enough and aware enough. Uh, I've heard schools use the term cultural IQ, uh, and that's really important. Okay, so what do schools look for? Uh, I'm getting to the end. Uh, trust me on this. I'm sorry for nattering on. Um, what what do schools look for? They firstly want teachers that they can hire. They need to be able to hire you, that you're a low visa risk. The last thing they want is to interview you, pay all the money for the visa, and then get it kicked back in their face because there's some Ministry of Education reason why they can't hire you. And that can have to do with experience, degree matching, nationality. There's many countries that have uh, certain nationalities that you can and can't hire. Um, many countries are using the term native English speakers, which I despise, but that's their term, meaning you're coming from a country where English is the home language, one of the home languages. Um, and this is one of those visa protectionist things. You know, why can't you hire a Chinese teacher to do this job? Well, I need a native English speaker because I'm, you know, I want the children to learn in English. Uh, criminal history is another issue. So again, disclose that to the school, disclose it to us uh, because you, this will get kicked back in your face once they do the checks. Again, medical issues, um, again, disclose it. And family, uh, if your partner can't get a visa or you can't sponsor your partner or your, your kids, that's just, they're going to be thinking about how happy is your entire family going to be in their environment. Next, if they can hire you, they're gonna be looking for people who can add value. These are fee paying schools by and large, and they want to show value to their parents. So they want people who can get good academic results in the classroom. And when you're writing your CV or resume, you need to be thinking about this. How are you demonstrating this on your CV? Can you get good academic results? Have you brought children from point A to point B? Have you dealt with English language learners and had great success? Where can you point to this, to actual accomplishments? They're going to look for people who are value to the water school community, which can include co-curricular activities. So if you run a math club, please put that on your CV. If you've run even a jump roping class after school. They just want people who are involved in the water school community. So make sure you can demonstrate this on your CV. Um, next, they're going to look for teachers who can fit within the culture and ethos of the school. Um, they obviously are hiring you for your value that you can bring, but they also know that the school and the country are the hand and you're the glove and you need to fit with the culture of the school and the country. The last thing they want is somebody who, I don't know, is going to join the school and be a prima donna and say, well, this isn't the way we do it when I, where I come from. Um, you need to fit within their culture and you need to understand it, which is why when we match you to schools, we send you an awful lot of information about the school and the culture. And I please, please read it um, and digest it and figure out if this is a match for you. And again, it does require personal and professional resilience. And they're going to test you on this at interview. Um, teachers who are lower risk also have had proven experience in the curriculum. So if you're a South African teacher and you're trying to get your foot on the ladder of an American school, you are a higher risk because you've not taught their curriculum. You don't know it. You don't have proven results. We can't reference you in an American school. This is why you're a little bit lower down on the food chain. It's not that you're a bad teacher, it's that you don't have yet have proven experience. Um, they are also looking for solid references. They're looking for a stable work history. If you've moved around every year or two, they're going to then extrapolate that you're probably going to move around a year or two and they're not going to recoup their investment in you and your visa, even if you work out great. Um, and they're going to look at your personal situation. So if you've got an unmarried partner, you're a higher risk. If you've got a family of five, you're a higher risk because one of those five people could be unhappy and then that brings you all home. Okay, timelines. I'm almost at the end. Timelines, when do they hire? Answer is whenever they want, but uh, there are trends. Uh, 
So what I've done is I put a timeline of the year and I would note that most schools are, operate on the Northern Hemisphere calendar. So we're talking about September-ish to June-ish. Um, most schools hire once a year. So they're gonna ask their teachers if they want to renew their contracts or if they wish to return every year. And so if they say no, then they're going to then look to replace you, uh, it replace that teacher. So they tend to know that round about October at the very earliest down through March, April for an August or September start. And where I've uh, shown it in dark green near July, that's when they're gonna get a little bit more flexible on curriculum experience on, if they can hire less experienced teachers, this is when they're going to look to do it. In the earlier green stage, they're going to be looking for people who have more proven experience. And so if you're a newly qualified teacher, you're probably not going to get picked up or one who doesn't have curriculum experience in that curriculum of the school, you're probably not going to get picked up till later. And then there's a tiny little bump for January starts. We've got some January jobs now. These tend to be a little bit less uh, anticipated. So it might be that they're opening up a new class. Uh, they had more enrollment or it could be that there was a teacher that didn't work out. But generally speaking, there's a lot fewer of them. How to land a job. Um, first, please, please do your research. We will help you with this, uh, but I need you to do it on your own as well. You know you more than we know you. So um, I need you to be learners when it comes to teaching abroad. Um, the next stage is to apply. And if you apply through Advectus, then we are relatively certain that the school has hired people like you in the past. If you make a bunch of applications around, like on a job board or whatever, uh, you might not get a response because you don't know who else is applying and actually what that school is looking for, or indeed what kind of school it is. Just because it's called the British School of whatever doesn't mean it's truly a British expatriate school um, and that you don't know who they hire. Uh, so so you if you don't apply through us, I would say you're probably going to make a lot of applications and you might not get a lot of feedback. So just be prepared for that. This is where your resiliency comes in. Uh, first stage is an interview. Uh, normally, it's done on, on um, Teams or Zoom, especially now post-COVID. Some schools are still insisting on in-person interviews where possible. So they're coming to the UK or they'll do a traipse through the UK, US. Or you know, we even have some schools that we bring to South Africa so some of them really do like the in-person interview and i do too it's just a lot of investment in time and money uh, so i'd say 95 percent of jobs are landed through online interviews then you get an offer uh, once you sign the offer that lays out your pay, pay and benefits then you'll get a contract which again you can sign the offer you can turn down the contract uh, but, you know, the, the, it's usually a two-stage process. Uh, one has finer print than the other, and they just try to get the big stuff out of the way first with the offer letter. Once the contract is signed or the offer letter is signed, then uh, they will process your visa, your air ticket, and arrival. And they'll usually meet you at the airport, take you to your temporary or permanent accommodation, and off you go. So why teach abroad? Um, Firstly, because you really will save money. Honestly, uh, you will, uh, unless you've got some like serious Gucci habit. Um, it's really hard not to save money when you teach abroad because everything is paid for. Uh, you can hone your teaching skills and you can learn new methods of teaching. You're gonna be teaching next to people from all over the world who have had different experiences. You're gonna be learning new curricula and truly it's just a way of regenerating your teaching skills uh, in a way that you can't do in your home country. You will learn about new cultures in a, de in a deeper way. And obviously this is a little bit painful at first, in the first three to six months, it's tough. But once you get past that, it is just amazing to, ha to be culturally fluent in more than one country. Uh, it's, it's a gift. Um, you can travel to amazing locations on weekends and school breaks for very little money. So you're gonna be get access to these really cheap deals. Uh, so if you're in the Middle East, for instance, you can just jet off to Mauritius. Um, if you're in the Far East, Southeast Asia, you know, you can you can go to Bali at the drop of a hat. I mean, these things are just really affordable and at your doorstep. And the final thing is that you meet like minded people, people like you who are adventurous and willing to change and resilient um, of all different walks of life. So I think the people who teach on the international circuit are just fantastic. Um, there endeth my presentation.
Um, and let's go to questions, if this thing worked. OK. Um, any questions? It looks like Paul has answered most of them. But if you've got any questions, do drop them into the chat. Um, yeah, so the first question about doing a newly qualified ECT, you can do it abroad, but there's they, the schools have to be, um, they have to be inspected uh, by BSO, uh, British Schools Overseas, and those jobs are really mm -hmm. limited. So you can do it abroad. It's great to do it abroad, um, but there are limited opportunities there. Um, so uh, thank you everyone uh, for attending. And if you've got any further questions, please drop us a line at uh, teacher at advectus.com. And uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for um, joining our webinar and any feedback, any suggestions are gratefully received. We've got more webinars planned. We've got one about China, one about the state schools in the UAE. We're gonna have another one on Saudi Arabia and another one on Qatar coming up. So please do, uh, keep an eye. Thanks, everybody.